Hello everyone. I know that I have a lot of unfinished projects, and you are waiting for updates. First of all, I want to apologize and say that it's not as simple as it may seem. From a pile of components to a finished video is not just one step, and sometimes the fate of the project doesn't depend on me at all. There are always difficulties that may not be resolved quickly. Remember, back in the summer I bought a burnout variac at a flea market and said that I might turn it into a semi-automatic welder? No, I haven't made it yet, but I'm close to it, because I have everything I need. The problem is that I've made manual arc welders, both transformer and inverter types, multiple times. But a semi-automatic welder, that's a first for me. So, I have to study tons of information and come up with everything on the fly. One thing is clear, when all this is done, I'll have a homemade semi-automatic welder with good characteristics. But unfortunately, one video isn't enough. I plan to release two or three videos on this topic. At this stage, I already have a wound transformer and all the parts needed to create a good and reliable semi-automatic welder. This won't be a simple semi-automatic welder, but a quite serious one, with a good control board, the ability to adjust the delay time for the wire feed, gas valve, welding current, as well as automatic and manual operating modes. There will be electronic welding current adjustment, PWM control of the feed motor, and electronic contactless switching. In other words, no magnetic starters, no clicks, just thyristors. But all of the above, of course, are just words. I have no intention of teaching you what is right and what is not. Study the information, try different options, or buy a ready-made one. The solutions I have shown may be imperfect or even incorrect, because, I repeat, this is my first experience in creating a semi-automatic machine. All I have is just the information and components that are on hand. I don't want to spend money for now, so I'm using what I have. As a rule, any homemade welding machine starts with winding the transformer. As I already mentioned, the core is taken from a powerful burnout variac, and you can get around 3 to 3.5 three kilowatts from such a toroid. My advice to you, do not use a core from a variac. It has a small window, and it's not always possible to wind the desired coils. For a semi-automatic machine, a toroid is an ideal option due to its rigid volt-ampere characteristic. But if you can't find one, you can use the stator iron from a powerful asynchronous motor. Many people do this, after first removing the grooves where the winding was placed. In the case of manual arc welding, the no-load voltage of the transformer is several times higher than the voltage during welding, and using a transformer with a rigid characteristic is inappropriate there. In the case of semi-automatic welding, it's exactly the opposite. A transformer with a rigid volt-ampere characteristic is needed. Under high currents, the output voltage should not drop significantly. To start, let me show you what I've got. Here's the finished transformer. It outputs 21.5 volts, and that's not enough. I'll explain later why and how you can deal with this. I'm loading the transformer with a ballast. The load current is 80 amps. The output voltage dropped by only 1.4 volts. At a current of 150 amps, the output voltage is about 19.5 volts. It couldn't be more rigid. Regarding the winding data of the transformer, I'll be honest, I deviated significantly from the initial calculations because there was an issue with the window. Everything needed to be done to make the most efficient use of the core window. The primary winding was wound with two different wires because I couldn't buy proper winding wire. I had to disassemble a couple of excellent transformers. From there, I took winding wire of 2mm and 1.5mm. First, the primary winding was done with 2mm wire, then 2 of 1.5mm. That is, in terms of cross-section, it's at least 3 in 1 square. Why go to such lengths? Simply because there wasn't enough wire. The winding is done layer by layer, with turns evenly stretched across the entire core. Please don't judge too harshly regarding the neatness of the winding. This is used wire, and winding it neatly considering its diameter wouldn't have been possible anyway. I used cloth tape for insulation, and I soaked the tape in varnish. Yes, such insulation worsens the cooling conditions, but the primary winding here has a margin. Also, there will likely be a fan blowing on the transformer. 
When halfway through, I realized that due to the thick insulation, the window was filling up quickly and there was a chance that the secondary wouldn't fit. I started using Captain Tape, Cloth Tape, basically any thin insulating material for insulation. At the same time, I monitored the filling of the window and the current consumption of the primary winding. I calculated the winding, but in the end, I had to abandon the calculations and switch to an experimental method. After winding a certain number of turns, I connected the transformer to the network and measured the no-load current of the winding. I settled on a value of 1.5 to 1.6 amperes. And this is a necessary measure. If I increase the number of turns, further to reduce the no-load current, the secondary winding won't fit. After the primary was wound, the question of the secondary arose. I added one test turn and realized that the voltage here is about 1.2 volts per turn. I had a good copper bus bar with a cross section of 20 square millimeters on hand, but it would only allow for a few turns, which is clearly insufficient. There were two options, either find a bus bar or wire with a smaller cross section and wind the secondary for lower current, but higher voltage or sacrifice voltage in favor of maximum current. In the end, I chose the latter. I found Coil's wound with a 14 square millimeter copper bus bar, which I had once bought at a flea market. Unfortunately, this bus bar is not continuous, so the winding was done with pieces of the bus bar. The joints were soldered using copper tin sleeves, and then insulated with several layers of heat shrink tubing. In the end, the output voltage from the secondary winding is about 21 and a half volts. The cross section of the primary is a little over 3 square millimeters. The cross section of the secondary is 14 square millimeters, allowing for currents to 140 amps. The no load current of the transformer is 1.6 amps. You should always consider that there will be losses in the rectifier, and as a result, the secondary voltage might not be sufficient. Therefore, it's better to have a reserve of a couple or three volts, at the very least. In addition to its rigid characteristics, the toroidal transformer has another huge advantage. It is more compact than others with the same power. The transformer is ready, tested on a ballast, and everything is great with it, except that the secondary voltage is lower than desired. But this issue can be resolved by implementing a dual winding voltage booster choke, which we will discuss in another video. I hope it helps. When the transformer was ready, I received an order from AliExpress for a torch, also known as a hose, and a Euro connector. It's a budget hose, and I can't speak to the quality, but it arrived, intact. That's already pleasing. They will be lying in wait for their moment to shine. At that time, I stumbled upon the website Swapcot.ru and found there a schematic and board for the semi-automatic VOV 2.0. There are updated versions, but for some reason, I settled on this one. A link to the original source, as well as a detailed video demonstrating the schematics operation on my second channel, can be found in the description. The control of the welding processes and wire feed will be taken from here. The author shared both the schematic and the board, and it was made in the dip trace program. I quickly generated the Gerbers and ordered these boards, as always, from our sponsor JLCPCB, a company specializing in the production of high quality printed circuit boards and solder stencils. Technology capable of making printed circuit boards of any complexity, shapes, and sizes from your Gerber files. A wide selection of solder mask colors, many delivery options, and reasonable prices. There is a service for creating solder stencils and industrial 3D printing. GLC is the company with the full production cycle, so there is strict quality control, and your boards will always be of high quality. It is also possible to have instant board production in just 24 hours. There is also a $30 coupon available for the purchase of six layer printed circuit boards. Ease of use, affordability of manufacturing, and reliability. In this matter, trust the company GLC PCB. Link in the description. Upon receiving them, it became clear that the boards, as always, are high quality. But during the generation of the Gerbers, something went wrong, and some holes are much smaller in diameter than needed. Fortunately, these holes were not vias. So I widened them with a regular drill and started assembling the board. In the description of this video, I will leave a slightly modified board where I widened some holes and also converted the schematic to imported components. There will be a board in the usual LF format for us, as well as a folder. 
named Gerber for ordering boards from the factory. All you need to do is simply upload the specified folder to the manufacturer's website, pay for the order, and wait for delivery. The schematic includes a couple of Soviet microchips in the form of Schmidt Triggers K561TL1. If you can't find those, you can use the imported equivalent CB4093. I'm sure you'll find all the other components on the board in your stash. On this board, a simple PWM controller is assembled using a 555 timer and a MOSFET, which controls the feed motor. There are a couple of relays. One of them is activated when the button on the sleeve is pressed and opens the power thyristor, which, in turn, is responsible for supplying current to the wire, that is, for turning the welding current on or off. The other relay is responsible for starting or breaking the feed motor. The gas valve control is organized through a medium power composite transistor. There is an option to start the gas flow a couple of seconds before and after welding, so to speak, for purging. Moreover, the delay times are adjustable. You can even disable these delays entirely if you are working with flux cord wire. When you press the button on the torch first, Carbon dioxide is supplied. After the delay time expires, there is an automatic activation of the welding current in the feed motor. If you release the button, the current and feed are turned off, and finally the gas valve. There are manual and automatic welding modes. Moreover, in these two modes, you can work with the previously mentioned delays or without them. In the manual mode, welding occurs when you press the button and stops when you release it. In the automatic mode, there is a regulator that sets the welding time. It can be adjusted from 0 to 15 seconds. When you press the button, the welding current is supplied for a set time, then everything turns off, regardless of how long you hold the button. This is convenient. If you need to make neat drops or seams of the same length, Moreover, in this mode, if you release the button, maybe you changed your mind, the welding will stop. There are LEDs on the board that visualize the operation of the main components. They can be brought out to the front panel of the semi-automatic machine or left on the board, but it's better to duplicate them. The adjustable resistors for setting the purge time don't need to be brought out to the front panel, I think. You set everything up once, according to your needs, and that's it but the regulator responsible for the feed speed, as well as the welding time regulator in automatic mode, mode switches, and belay switches need to be brought out to the front panel. It would seem this board does everything needed, but if you look at the diagram, it becomes clear that it doesn't regulate the welding current, and that's not a flaw. It was designed that way. The current in this semi-automatic machine is regulated by switching the taps of the transformer's primary winding. In my case, there are no taps and there couldn't be any. I barely fit the main winding here, and there clearly wouldn't be enough space for taps. Therefore, my regulation will be electronic, based on thyristors. But, that's another story. In the next part, we will work on the power rectifier, which will also serve as a current regulator. And we will also select other power components, wind a dual winding, voltage boosting choke, and discuss capacitors in the feed mechanism. If we're lucky, we might even get the first weld on the homemade semi-automatic machine. Let me remind you that all necessary links can be found in the description of this video. Don't forget to rate the video and follow my Instagram to stay updated. And with that, I say goodbye. As always, this was Kazianov with you, K, and until next time, bye.